So I'm like, okay, woohoo, sunshine, sunshine. Let's get that beautiful pro cat of Ola golden peacock out right now and do the care collab video together with Teresa's corner. Thank you, Teresa, for joining me on this care collab. I really appreciate it. But then I thought, oh my goodness, you can't really appreciate the gorgeous, gorgeous orange blooms because the sun is washing them out. And I'm thinking I may need to reposition, but I did want to show them in the sun, even though the color is coming out a bit more canary yellow, but you can see when the shadow hits, look at that orange there. There's nothing more prettier than blooms in the sun in real life, but when it comes to filming, not so much. So I'm gonna get resituated and let's talk about her. There we go, that's a bit better. Close up, money shot. Not quite, because you can see I have some fungicide spray on the leaves, but the blooms, they look gorgeous. Yeah, forgive me for the fungicide spray. I thought that I would do this as a preventative measure, just in case she was taken through the ringer when I divided her. And the reason I divided her is because she is such a vigorous grower. So if you want an orchid that can possibly bloom three times a year, blooms on every single new growth. I mean, if you can forfeit the fragrance because she doesn't have a fragrance, then I would say you must have a Procatabola golden peacock. Now, this winter growth only gave me three blooms, but normally I get five to six blooms out of a single spike. Understandable, she didn't get as much light during the winter, even though I do supplement with artificial light. I don't have them on 12, 13 hours a day. I have them on eight hours, and if I forget, nine. But uh, I don't have them on a timer, so eight hours is my minimum. But three blooms, if you're in a hemisphere and you want to grow this orchid indoors, you can be absolutely certain to get three blooms out of every single growth. In ideal conditions, the spikes can bloom eight to 10 blooms. I have never achieved that with mine. And she's been with me for three years. She is now 60% of her original size, but nonetheless, despite the stress of being divided and chopped up and repotted, she still managed to throw out a bloom spike on her little growth that is a little bit smaller than what I am normally used to. But still, this orchid, again, no fragrance. She is a cross between the Brassocatlia Richard Mueller and the Prostechia vitellina, or maybe Encyclia vitellina, but to my understanding, it's now Prostechia vitellina. And the Richard Mueller is a cross between the Brassavola nodosa and the Catlia milleri. Unfortunately, that parentage is lost in this cross, which is a shame because there is no fragrance from the nodosa. Nonetheless, nonetheless, it is a gorgeous little orchid. I wouldn't want to be without it. She is so reliable with regards to her blooms. And what I really appreciate also is that she's a little bit of a color changer. She still looks a little bit too yellow on camera, as opposed to what real eyes see. You see, again, the sun is there, washing out the orange. Here you can see a true orange of what the blooms are like in real life. Every time the sun comes out, you can see how it changes a bit. And then when the sun goes back behind the clouds, she goes back to her original orange. Anyway, what I was talking about color changing has nothing to do with the sun in this case. But uh, when she opens up, she has more of a bronze and a brownie look. The striations in the petals is much more defined with a brown line. And then eventually she turns into this fantastic Valencian Naranja orange. Valencia has the best oranges here in Spain, in my opinion, and they have an orange about them that defies any kind of description. And this is what it reminds me of. I think this is a cross that if you are growing in the home, you would be delighted to be able to have it. It is a very easy grower in that regard. It is a very vigorous grower and it is a prolific bloomer. And you can grow that in your home, windowsill styly, no need to get any kind of extra special humidity around it. I don't have a lot of humidity in my climate 
and she lives outdoors in the summer in my south side where she gets bright, bright shade. Very rarely does she get direct sun unless it is like late, late afternoon just before it sets or possibly early morning and then it's already behind the pillar and behind the curtain. She does need a lot of light because of the parentage. You've got Nodosa in there, you've got Caplia in there, even in Cyclia. All of those parents do make her a highlight orchid, but there is no need to go to an extreme with her to get her to bloom. In my climate, in my environment here in southern Spain, I have her in bright, bright shade with lots of reflecting light from the walls, which are all white. Maybe in a different hemisphere, north hemisphere, she can be right at the window and she can tolerate the direct sun. It's just touching the leaves is important to make sure that they don't heat up. When the leaves feel hot, that is probably a good time to move her or pull a curtain so that she has a little bit of a breathing moment and doesn't get stressed out, doesn't burn the leaves, or high, high ventilation to keep the leaves cool. But other than that, there's no need for this one to get any fancy treatment regarding greenhouse, humidifier, heat mat, or anything like that. Mine is already throwing out its first new growth right here of the season. And I say first, because I am hoping to get some more on another lead right here, but we'll give her some time. She's not settled in the pot yet. Let me check, I've never done my tug test with her. Oh, but yeah, never mind that. She is pot bound again. No need to worry about this one. When I repotted her, I wasn't exactly waiting for new roots because being an orchid that is growing new growth or is in bloom or is doing two at the same time, bloom, new growth, when do you repot? You wanna keep the blooms, you want to enjoy the blooms, and then you don't repot. Well, I had a window of opportunity and I took advantage because the two years prior that I've had her, she did nothing but bloom. And every time she bloomed, she was throwing out a new growth. Granted, at the time I had plenty of room in the pot and I didn't have to intervene. But when it came to year three to change her environment in the pot, not the setup, I've always grown her in Lekka and self-watering. But when it came time to change her environment in the pot and get some cleanup done around the roots, etc., <laughs> I had to kind of wait right at a mark where she had just finished blooming and was already throwing out new growth, but, and that was this one here, but it was now or never. It was a thing of do it now or you're not gonna do it again in another 12 months. Despite being so vigorous on the bloom front, being so generous about all that, I don't tire of these blooms. So I've never ever said, I'm gonna forfeit the blooms, I'm gonna repot. I was really pushing it to the wire. Yep, I broke a leaf. So that is what happens when you break a leaf on a golden peacock. That was just mechanical damage. She did not suffer through the repot at all. I'm going to bring the division and show you. Here is the division. Doesn't look as dark as the other one. Also had the fungicide treatment. And the reason it doesn't look as dark as the other one, because I kept it inside a little bit more protected, not as bright light, not directly under the blurple light where the parent plant lives during the winter, because I wanted, didn't want to stress it out while it is getting accustomed to its new pot and having been separated and being manhandled around the root system. I had a few roots to, that could go in. They were still viable, but when you divide an orchid and you're working with LECA, there's always a lot, a lot of collateral damage of healthy roots. So even though they're viable, they were tired after I had finished with them. But look at her, new roots and she has not produced a new growth yet. And there's another little nubbin right tucked in the between. So there's a second root growing out of that spot. No new growth. She dropped one leaf in the back here just recently, but I need roots so that I can ship this off to the new owner, healthy with an established root system. And that is exactly what she's doing. And it did not take me anything to get that done. She's doing it all on her own. She is not pot bound. 
but we're getting there. So by the time it is ready to send her on, she will be good to go. And that is what I like about this Procatavola. It's a no-nonsense orchid. Yep, there is no fragrance, but everything else is so easy going. I water her regularly, abundantly flush her, especially when it is like in the winter months because I don't want the pot to go stagnant. So she gets flushes about maybe once a week during the winter and depending on temperature of the ambient air, maybe twice a week. And when I say that, if I have gloomy days on the trot, like I had in the last 10 days, I don't flush her because I don't have water in the reservoir. I don't need to worry about it. She is blooming, she's growing a new growth. I know spring is on the way. I don't have to worry about filling the reservoir with water when it is a gloomy day. She is a warm to hot grower because of all her parentage. So when it gets down to 14 degrees in my dining room, I don't need to be pushing my luck with the root system by keeping it super wet. Sounds a little bit of an oxymoron, the fact that I'm growing in self-watering and LECA. The LECA having an evaporative cooling effect cools the root down, and I'm saying I'm not keeping her as wet in a self-watering pot. Well, I, I kind of, I have a very wet time of year where the pots, the reservoirs are literally full up and the bottom of the pot settles on the water with the amount that is being evaporated and being consumed by the orchid. And when it comes to the winter, I don't do that. And that's why I say my environment in the pot is drier, never, never dry. I never let the microfiber dry out, but it is drier in comparison to what I do in the summer, where it's just, how much water do you need? Okay, I'll give you a bit more than that. That's sort of my principle when I talk about drier in the winter. But then, now that we are having another week of great weather, today she's getting her flush, and little one here is getting a flush as well. So I'm treating this one a little bit more cautiously on the light level, so as not to stress it. This one here, you can see, has the blurple lights very close to it, and it's a little bit darker on the leaf. But she is a mature plant, she has more reserves. This one I'm treating like a seedling, to get it established in the pot and focus on roots as opposed to stressing the leaves out too much. She gets light, but not as much as the bigger plant. So I have not fertilized any of them in the last two weeks. And during the winter, I may go with 160 parts per million fertilizer into the pot. It all depends on what my weather is doing. If I have a good window of a week to 10 days where it'll be sunny but cool, then of course with the supplemental light, I am okay to fertilize a little bit. But then I stop and it's more flushing because forecasts can be a problem here. They're not always reliable. And then I'm just very, very cautious. And that's not why I'm saying this growth is smaller. This growth is smaller because of the division and having to settle back into the pot and start anew. In summer, I fertilize at 300 parts per million. So once the weather in the night starts to steady around 15 degrees, I'm going back to my 300 parts per million fertilizer. I've got a new growth coming. She is in my books in active growth and it's time to push her and help her and get her established and fill the pot again. And we can divide her again and start the whole thing over from the beginning. <laughs> but this one is just getting flushes. There is a little bit of water in the bottom of the reservoir, just a little bit, more than the parent plant, because the roots in this pot, when I potted her up, only made it down to here. And I want the humidity in the pot to help me get the roots in and encourage them to grow down quicker to search out the moisture. So this one was treated like a seedling had a little bit more water, even though the roots never touch the water, if that makes sense. Same thing, I don't want it to be too cold in the winter. These are warm to hot growers, all the parents are. Gotta be a little bit careful with this grow method when it comes to winter, but if in doubt, only flush and just take a little bit of the runoff water for the bottom of the mask to maintain the humidity and the wet feel, squeeze the microfiber feel, some drops of water, that is all is necessary and it doesn't need to be 
totally full in the pot. They live indoors in the winter. I can manage my 14, 15 degrees in the dining room. And in the summer, bright, bright shade. In my climate, no direct sun. And it will be rewarding me, hopefully, on this new growth with a spike again of five to six blooms. The odd mealybug is a pest issue I might have. It's not an issue in the real sense of the word, but it's something that does occur when the growth and the spike starts to develop right down in the node of the growth. That is the only thing, and it's not even an issue. It's just something to be mindful of, and I keep an eye out for that, just to be 100% sure. Don't need anybody attacking the orchids. Other than that, seriously, you want something bright and cheerful, floriferous, easy to grow. If you're only growing indoors, if you're on a windowsill, there's no issue with this orchid regarding demanding about humidity or anything like that. For me, it's a keeper despite no fragrance. I wouldn't be without her. If you have this orchid, and if you're new to my channel, you haven't heard about the Care Collab Initiative, then let me please invite you to let me know and send me an email that you have this orchid, you do videos, and then I would love to get you on board for future updates on our Pro Catavola Golden Peacock. Meanwhile, thank you very much, Teresa's Corner, for taking the time out of your busy schedule, for doing this care collab together with me. I think she is a worthy orchid to be having her own little care collab series and future updates, I hope that we have more channels on board. I would welcome it. Again, my email is in the description below. Thank you everybody for taking the time to watch this video. If you have any further questions or pointers that I did not address and I did not circle back to, then please, please feel free to let me know in the comments below and I'll be very happy to elaborate further. Have a wonderful day and please, please stay safe. Take care. Bye.